Welcome to IB Chemistry SL uh, Option D Drugs and Medicine video number four. Today we're going to talk about depressants. Uh, as the name says it, depressants are drugs that depress or lower the activity of the central nervous system. So they are going to act by uh, changing uh, the levels of different chemicals called neurotransmitters and those act on the brain. All right. Some of the general effects that uh, depressants have is that they are going to decrease mental uh, or brain activity. Uh, in addition, they will cause a lowering in the breathing and the heart rates uh, by acting on the brain. Um, and they will uh, cause a decreased me metabolism due to the lower intake of oxygen. So if there's less oxygen that's going into the blood, we are going to slow down our energy uh, production because we're going to have lower cellular respiration. All right. The effects um, of depressants basically depend on the dose that you get. All right. So let's look at that. If you have a low dose, they're going to be called uh, tranquilizers, and they normally are going to reduce, uh, induce a sense of relaxation, calmness. You're going to lower your uh, anxiety. Um, they also can act as muscle relaxants. So if you are stressed, if you have real nuts uh, in your uh, on your back, all those kind of things, they're just going to start melting away because all of those uh, nerve endings that are keeping uh, the muscles contracted are going to relax. All right. If you increase the dose to a mid-range dose, uh, you're going to have what are called sedatives. Uh, they can cause uh, slurred speech. They can cause staggering and uncoordinated walk, uh, and an altered perception. So they uh, are just to kind of really bring you down much more than a tranquilizer. All right. Um, as we increase the uh, uh, dose. You can then induce sleep, or they can cause loss of consciousness, and those those types are called hypnotics. In very large and very high doses, they can cause respiratory depression, which means that you are not going to get enough oxygen. If that happens, that can induce um, coma, and on the most extreme cases, it can cause death. All right, antidepressant drugs um, are actually, in general are a type of uh, drugs that are used for clinical depression. Antidepressants are depressant drugs. All right, uh, That's a little bit confusing. It's antidepressant in the sense that they act on clinical depression, a psychological term, but they act on the body by depressing, lowering the activity of the central nervous system. That's why they're called depressant drugs. All right. Uh, in the past, we've talked about uh, strong analgesics. Strong analgesics are also a depressant drug. That's why they can cause stupor. All right. So let's look at the most uh, widely used uh, depressant. The most widely used depressant is ethanol or alcohol. All right. Uh, it's pressed, of course, in alcoholic drinks, in beer, wine. It's been used since antiquity. And um, let's talk a little bit about what the effects are. All right. In low doses, uh, alcohol uh, causes relaxation. It may cause a little bit of mild excitement because of decreased inhibitions. Uh, that also helps people have a sense of confidence, and people are a little bit more talkative. Again, decreased inhibitions. All right. Um, positive uh, side effects of low doses of alcohol is that they can have an anticlotting effect, and they can re relaxation of the bl blood vessels, so it can improve circulation and lower. Uh, high blood pressure. All right, that is um, obviously in low doses, small amounts. All right, when you have uh, alcohol abuse, when we're looking at high doses, we're going to look at two different uh, perspectives. We're going to look at the acute, high dose, short term, and high dose, uh, long term, which are the chronic effects of alcohol. So if we're looking at a, an acute uh, high dose of alcohol. You're going to have people to have loss of self-restraint. It's, it's an extreme case of loss of inhibitions. It's, it decreases inhibitions, but to the point that people will do things that they are normally not going to do. This also um, means that they are going to be will have more violent behavior. They're going to have a more violent response to uh, things. They're going to be risk-taking. Again, um, has to do with in, um, less inhibition, uh, impaired reasoning. Um, so you're not going to be able to 
really make a proper analysis of things. Uh, it can cause uh, memory loss or memory gaps, what are called blackouts, if you have an acute uh, high dose uh, that could actually make you forget what was going on. Um, you cannot concentrate uh, well, so impaired concentration. It will slow down your reflex time, so um, your, your reflexes, so you increase the response time, so that's a, why it's a problem for driving. Uh, it has a low, low um, loss of coordination and balance. It can cause nausea, vomiting, uh, which can lead to dehydration. Uh, if you take extreme amounts, it can then get to be alcohol poisoning, and again, that can lead to coma and um, to death. All right. So uh, that is some of the uh, effects of um, acute uh, high doses of uh, alcohol. In the long run, if you're uh, abusing alcohol for a long time, uh, some of the things that are going to happen, well, first of all, you're going to have a small buildup of tolerance, but you're going to have dependence. Um, so you're going to become addicted to alcohol. Uh, it can also have um, cause liver disease, um, uh, coronary or and heart disease. All right, um, arthrosclerosis, uh, arthrosclerosis, which is the hardening of the blood vessels, which then leads to high blood pressure. Notice that in low effects, low doses, it can lower your um, blood pressure. But after you um, abuse alcohol for a long time. Because it affects the blood vessels, it, they become less flexible, all right? Then that causes uh, high blood pressure. Um, abuse of alcohol can also cause permanent brain damage. Uh, if a um, person who's drinking alcohol is pregnant, it can cause uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, which uh, normally has to do with uh, problems with brain uh, development in uh, the baby and also low um, birth weight, all right? Uh, in extreme cases, um, that liver disease that I had uh, here uh, put in an asterisk can cause liver uh, cancer or cirrhosis of the liver, so basically damage beyond uh, what the liver itself can repair. The, the liver is one of the few or organs uh, in humans that is very good at self-repairing, but if you uh, abuse it too much, it cannot do that uh, beyond... Um, you know, it goes beyond its, its repairing uh, power, all right? Alcohol also has synergistic effects with other drugs, all right? So some of the ones that I want to talk about, uh, aspirin. Um, because alcohol makes aspirin more soluble, it can go past the protective layer of the stomach and actually interact with the parts that do not, uh, that, that are, are not acid resistant, and so they can, it can cause stomach bleeding, all right? Uh, this is one of the reasons why you're not supposed to take aspirin uh, after drinking. Um, with uh, depressants, it can cause heavy uh, sedation and could lead to coma uh, if, because again, the drugs become much more soluble and more, uh, you're going to get larger concentration in the bloodstream. Uh, drugs are calculated to be taken up, for example, if you're taking a pill by taking by the digestive system with water or something like that, and um, some of it would be excreted if you actually have uh, something that helps dissolve the drug, then you're going to have a higher concentration in your bloodstream. Um, with tobacco and smoke, all right, it also increases the solubility of some of the carcinogenic compounds because uh, the alcohol will be in, dissolved in your um, blood, and so as the smoke and products, the carcinogenic compounds, are in the alveoli, they can actually diffuse and dissolve into the um, out the alcohol containing bloodstream, all right? And with other drugs, uh, it can increase liver toxicity because it already is attacking the liver. The liver will not have as much activity, so uh, that is a possibility. With some other drugs, it may cause them to be inactive. Therefore, the dose that you're taking is not going to be working, all right? Alcohol uh, can normally be detected uh, in the bloodstream uh, by one of uh, several different methods. Um, the most common one is the breathalyzer, but there are different types of breathalyzers. Chemical breathalyzer, alcohol that is in your bloodstream, comes out in your breath because the contact between the alveoli and your bloodstream. So some of the blood, some of the alcohol from the blood will actually evaporate and come and, and diffuse 
into the air that you're expelling, all right? And so if you blow uh, through a tube that contains acidified potassium dichromate, which is orange, uh, it will turn uh, green if ethanol is present. The ethanol will be oxidized into ethanoic acid. You know this from uh, redox reactions and from organic chemistry. Here is the balanced equation. All right, we start with ethanol and the dichromate, which is orange. All right, and it will react to form uh, ethanoic acid and the chromium three ion, which is green. That color change is an indication of the presence of ethanol. All right. Now uh, there are better methods uh, to do. You could blow. Uh, you could take. Uh, sorry, you could take some of the a sample of blood or urine and isolate. All right, uh, the ethanol from it, and then it is combusted. And from that uh, combustion, from the amount of carbon dioxide and water that is produced, you can get a very accurate reading of how much carbon, um, sorry, how much ethanol was present in that sample of blood. You can get a percentage, you can get a, a concentration, but uh, the process is very accurate. It's time consuming, uh, more than difficult, really. And because it's so time consuming, uh, it's not always used. But um, that is very accurate. Another way to do it is to do uh, IR spectroscopy. We will be looking at uh, the, that image in just a moment. But uh, IR spectroscopy infrared is uh, you're going to blow uh, a sample, or you can take a sample from urine or blood, all right? And it's going to be put into an IR spectrometer. Uh, and to observe the absorption of the infrared uh, radiation, all right? Different bonds will absorb at different uh, frequencies, all right? Around 2950 uh, wave numbers, reciprocal centimeters are called wave numbers, all right? Uh, you're going to see the characteristic stretch for the CH bond in ethanol. If you really go and look at ethanol itself, it's going to be really at 2980, uh, 2981 exactly uh, reciprocal, um, nanometers, uh, uh, reciprocal centimeters. Um, which it's much more accurate if you want to know, but generally speaking, around 2950 or so, that's where you're going to have the CH stretch. Uh, depending on how big that CH stretch is, that absorption at that point is, you can calculate uh, the amount of ethanol present. The OH bond has a very, very large absorption, but the reason why we don't use it is that the OH bond is also present in water, all right? And so it we be... Um, it could confuse uh, the results. And here we have then all the different stretches and absorptions that you see for ethanol, all right? And so this one over here is the one that we use to uh, determine the amount of ethanol present. All right, uh, another method to do this is to actually take a sample of blood or urine, vaporize it, and put it into a gas chromato chromatograph, uh, a gas chromatograph. Uh, and you can have a column that will separate the compounds because of their boiling points and the retention. And we can actually have, um, you're going to get peaks for each one of the compounds as they come out. If you put a small uh, sample of a standard, regularly, normally propanol, uh, you know how much propanol you put in. And comparing the size of the peak of your standard to the peak when um, ethanol comes out, you can find out how much ethanol was present in uh, the blood sample, all right? So those are uh, the ways in which ethanol can be measured, um, um, and you can actually determine the concentration of ethanol in blood, all right? Now I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about some other um, depressant uh, drugs, all right? Uh, a particular type of depressant drug uh, is called... Um, and they're used as antidepressants or as also as sedatives, uh, are called um, benzodiapazines, and that's because they contain a diapazine ring, all right? Let me show you these particular uh, drugs, all right? They tend to act by depressing the activity of the brain's emotional con uh, control center, all right? And they help alleviate um, anxiety. They're what we call the... the, the um, what it was called um, sedatives, all right? Um, and the two most famous ones are diazepam, 
which is Valium, and, and Nitrazepam, which is uh, Morgadon. Morgadon is much more popular in Europe, Valium, uh, so they were present, present all around the world. All right? So let me show you what uh, the diazepine uh, ring looks like. The diazepine ring is a seven-member ring that contains two nitrogen atoms. All right, so there are five carbons and a nitrogen atom. All right, and you'll notice a couple of things. It contains an amide group. All right, the difference between diazepam and nitrazepam is just this group here. So you can imagine that these two drugs have very similar action. They interact with the same part of the brain. All right? And because they're relatively nonpolar, all right, they can go through the uh, brain blood barrier, the BBB, quite easily to act on the brain. All right? There is another antidepressant uh, that is called Prozac. Uh, and the active ingredient in Prozac is fluoxetine. But fluoxetine is not a depressant drug itself. It does not depress brain activity. It has completely different function. It acts by increasing the levels of serotonin, it's just a neurotransmitter, and that acts directly in the emotional control center of the brain. All right? Now, look at the structure of um, fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is actually even more nonpolar all right, than uh, that the uh, benzodiazepines drugs that we saw before. So if we were to give this as a pill just directly as it is, this drug would not be absorbed by the digestive system. All right? And so what we do is this drug is actually given as the hyd uh, hydrochloride salt. All right? We add HCl. The H will bond to the lone pair on the nitrogen to form a positive ion and then we'll have the, ca uh, the chlorine just bonded there as an ionic bond. All right? Now if you make this an ionic compound, all right, it now can be absorbed by the digestive system in the stomach all right? and once it's absorbed into the bloodstream it is neutralized and you regain, you lose the H plus, all right, the hydrochloride is neutralized and you get fluoxetine again. Fluoxetine, one more time over here, is very nonpolar. It can go through the BBB, act on the brain, increase the serotonin levels, and um, stabilize uh, your mood. All right? So that is it. That is uh, depressants. Uh, see you next time for the next video. Thank you.